Okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another podcast. Uh, and today I'd like to introduce our guest. Uh, well, my name is uh, Adam Willoughby, and our second presenter is uh, Paul. Uh, Str- uh, Paul Australia, not I can't pronounce it. Second name. Like it. It, it's okay. I'm Greek. It, it's typical. Yeah. It happens. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our guest uh, for this po- uh, for this podcast episode, uh, Steve Lewis, um, who is a consultancy in, uh, researcher at uh, British Steel, um, who is working on uh, rail uh, rail steels. Um, so, first up, uh, Steve, I'd like to just uh, you know talk about a bit of a, about your background. Um, so, what actually interested you in like rail, you know, in the rail industry? In uh, in, well, my my journey into rail was a bit of an accident, to be honest. Um, I'd have to go right back to um, to childhood. So I've I've always been interested in how things work. Um, mm. Just watching mechanical things. I was f- as early as I can remember. I've I just loved mechanical things and watching them and and just just playing with things like that and as I got a bit older I got into the kind of um, the model making and um, and whatnot and building building stuff from kits and and taking them apart again was just as fun as putting them back putting them together um, and that really led on to my first degree which is in mechanical engineering um, mm. A, I, I sat down with a career. I, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do at school, um, and I wasn't academic up until the point I went to university. I was not academic. If you'd have seen me when I was at school, um, you would have, um, you know, the odds on me being a having a PhD were, were quite long. You wouldn't have put money on it. Um, so I sat down with a careers researcher and kind of spoke to them about what I was interested in and, and she said to me oh you want to do a degree in mechanical engineering um, so from that point on that's, that path was set um, I went to the University of Hertfordshire did my mechanical engineering degree there um, and up until that point I'd still not really had any interaction with railways um, I was, but at that point in my life I kind of wanted to go into the motorsport sector uh, that was my interest and passion at the time. Um, and then I graduated, and, and this is just kind of a, how it's it, how everything's just come down to chance, really, and, and it's been kind of fateful that I ended up in rail, is that I graduated in 2007 just as the... Um, just as the, um, the, the financial crisis, if you... If you picture it a bit like a tsunami, 2007 was the time when the tide was going out just before the tidal Mm. wave came in. So I graduated just as the tide was going out. And I'd always wanted to um, go into industry before I did a PhD. Um, So I'd applied for jobs left, right and centre and they all just dried up. You know, the the leads never went anywhere. Um, So I thought, well, maybe I should... um, have a look at some PhDs, um, had a few interviews, came to Sheffield um, and there, there was a PhD um, with with Roger Lewis and no relation by the way, um, in railways, uh, in rail engineering and just, you know, got offered the job and that, that was it really and I've been in rail ever since then. Um, and the, the passion really for it has just grown from there. You know, it's a, it's an interesting engineering uh, challenge, should we mm. say? It, it's um, it's it's. For, I think all engineering all engineering aspects are a challenge. And if you're if you're of a problem solving mindset, um, then you you'll find any area of engineering um, a challenge. Um, so I've I've been in rail since then, and the, the the longer you spend in it, the more you find out, the more you learn, the more you get interested, um, and yeah, it, it it just grows from there really. Um, so the, the the PhD that I did was actually uh, was in tribology, and even though it's in the mechanical engineering uh, department at Sheffield University, it's a very um, 
it's a mixture of mechanical engineering and materials engineering and that's kind of where i learned my materials skills from um in from doing tribology um so i'd, I'd probably classify myself as a materials engineer now um but I, i've got that mechanical background as well um and yeah and god knows how many years later 13 years later or something i'm uh, I'm a senior rail consultant, um, still working very closely with the university. Um, and what I love about my job at the minute is I've got the mixture of the commercial um, and the the R and D. I, I really like that balance of um, in in the university. It's very it's a very R and D oriented. Um, environment which i which i did love but i kind of i think i got to my limit um in that environment and i i wanted some commercial drive and the, the balance that i've got now is that I, I really enjoy it you know you've got the you've got the pressure of the commercial um and the, the way that that drives the r d where you're actually trying to solve a a, a real problem you know the, the 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 problems that arise in the commercial sector and I'm not, this is no discredit to to the academic, but um, the 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 problems that are driven by the commercial sector are those what we'd call high TRL problems. You know, they're, they're problems that can be solved, um, or not. Or not, they might be difficult problems, but they you know they they affect the everyday um, person in the street, shall we say? Um, yeah. And that, that you can really see a benefit. Um, come in, um, you know, to society or the rail industry or, you know, um, wherever it may be. That's, yeah, I think, I mean, I think a lot of people are like that, because I mean, that that's how I sort of view, uh, view my sort of research. That's why I got into like, wanted to do a PhD is like, I also wanted to like do, re, you know, re, research in rail because I wanted to help, you know, yeah. you know, I wanted to help make a difference. But yeah, I can, I can understand that. I think a lot of people can connect with that. Um, getting back to your, your like your PhD and uh, all that, was there was it you know tribal the like tribological aspect of railway contacts was that a sort of an interest you had you know you like you proposed for a PhD? No, um, no. Again, it was it was an accident. Um, so I'd I'd looked. At, I think I had at least three different interviews for a PhD studentships one was in in wind turbines i can't remember mm. quite. i think it was aerodynamics more than more than mechanical engineering aspects another one was in engine design um and it was it was, it was more of a, a systems level phd and then there was this one which was tribology which was um more of a mechanical materials um project and the I mean, the, the benefit of a, an engineering degree, whether it's mechanical or materials, is it gives you that core skill set so mm. that when you come out of university, you can choose. There's, there's, there's a massive variety of different things that you can work on, not just rail. There's automotive, there's, there's wind turbines, there's, you know, there's power generation, um, there's offshore oil drilling there's all sorts and the, the, the sectors are expanding all the time you know as technology progresses there's um there's new areas and and that's really why i kind of had the choice i think when i came out of university is that i the the degree in mechanical engineering gives you that toolbox and once you've got that toolbox once you've got your degree certificate you can then go out then and say right choose choose what you want to do you some people develop an interest quite early on my interest was motorsport you know i just had a a real passion for that and i suppose i was fortunate in a way that i chose to do a sandwich uh, um a year in industry which was at the time it was called a sandwich year um and i actually got um thrown into the the motorsports um arena through that not directly um but i was working for a supplier to a lot of formula one teams and motorsport teams so i got a taste of it early on before i'd actually got my degree and 
that was really helpful because I realised that actually I don't want to do this. Mm. Um, you know, this even though I, I I love watching the races on the weekend and you know knowing all the technical aspects about the car and and what not. Actually, I don't want to work here. And that, I think that was quite a fortunate thing for me. So when I came out of university, I not lost the passion, but all of a sudden that obsession to go into one specific area had gone. And and again, my 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 horizons had opened up. Um, and really, it was just through having that choice that I just fell into rail. Rail just seemed to be the right place for me at the time. At the time, and I've I've been there ever since. But it, it could quite easily have happened with with any other industry, um, I think. Um, and then you get there and you develop a special, um, you know, um, an expertise. And and I've, I've been there ever since. But you know, so, some other people, you know, I've I've watched other people's careers and they don't. They don't specialise in one area. They, they tend to move about, and there's nothing wrong with that aspect of it either. You know, I, I quite admire people that can do that. They can pick up some skills and play about with them for a couple of years, and then they can just move on to something else. I, I think that's quite good how some people can do that. Uh, whereas I, I tend to have just kept kept get, accumulating these skills in rail. And I'm just building on them all the time, and I, I'm building a, a career from that. It's 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 just a different way of doing things, and yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Like, did you think like uh, like specialising is it? You know, was that beneficial, or would you say like like in your opinion, like does like you know specialising in your top, you know, in the, in the real industry, uh, was that beneficial in progressing, or do you think actually having this? Because yeah, uh, no. Yeah, um, well, actually, uh, so let's go on like, to the PhD. Um, how, does that, how does that go? Like, during the PhD, how, you know, was it, did you find it, you know, was there a struggle with it? Uh, was it easier than you expected? Um, no, I mean, you can't really say that PhDs are easy. They're, they're, um, they're unique, shall we say. Um, yeah. Um, it, it started off quite well and going back to my my school days and where I was saying that you know if you just if you just see me at school you wouldn't have put money on to f- me you know doing a PhD I was very very unacademic mm-hmm. um, as a child I think because I'd found um, a way of making a profession out of my passion which was things that move and yeah. things and you know things with wheels and uh, all that uh, it unlocked something in me and that brought out the academic in me so throughout my degree I really put my head down and and worked quite hard and because because I just enjoyed it I really really liked it all of a sudden I'd gone from this um, kid at school that just didn't enjoy it and, and couldn't sen- seem to really learn anything um, because, you know, I, I, at school you're learning things left, right and centre and, you know, you're good at some things, you're bad at other things. And then all of a sudden I'd gone to university and it was just engineering every day. Every day was how things work, how to calculate how things work, just more and more of that and that really kind of drove me um so i'd gone from just to give you an image of you know uh, what hap- happened to me i'd gone from someone who was really struggling at school to someone by the end of the first year at university people were offering to pay me money to tutor them in in mechanical engineering sub- subjects and i i couldn't believe it i, I just couldn't you know it, it, it was just amazing Um, So that carried on into my PhD, Um, so I took that momentum um, Mm. into it, and but by the time you get to within a year of having to write your thesis, things do start to get interesting, shall we say. All of a sudden you find that there's a mountain of work in front of you. And, And one thing that I did, which I'd recommend to any 
person that's doing a PhD, well, anybody that's doing anything right now, academic or not, is everything that you do every day, whether it's experiments or writing code or um, running a simulation, take some notes, but don't just leave them notes in your logbook, type them up. And I did that. Fortunately, for the first couple of years through my PhD, I used to write up everything that happened into kind of a semi-formal um, document. And I kept just adding pages and pages and that morphed into my thesis. And that mm. really, really helped because it reduced that mountain that I had to climb. I still had to climb a mountain in the third year but it really, really reduced that. And I think that's, the, that's that's one of the reasons why I finished within three and a bit a bit years, which is is quite rare for, for a lot of a lot of PhD candidates. They tend to uh, um, need that bit of extra time. Um, and I think it's because you don't realize how much work you have to do to write a thesis. You know, you are writing a book at the end of the day. Um, mm. So, just everything you do, just and everything that you do that's relevant to your thesis, just um, write it up. Just just take a mental note, and that's something that I've carried on into what I do now, which is less academic, but it, it's still I'm st still looking at bits of broken rail track or what have you, and I'm making mental notes and taking pictures and writing my ideas down while I'm doing the experiments, so that then when I come to write the report. I can I can put them in in there as well. I don't know if I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. There, but <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's useful. It's useful um, advice, really, because it's like keep making sure you have your ideas fresh in mind. You know, any ideas you had at the time, and you know, you have the record of that, and also it reduces your burden. Um, yeah, I think. Mean, yeah. Um, one thing we uh, sort of noticed is that you did a lot of consultancy work um, before, during, and after the PhD. Uh, oh, uh, you've, yeah. <laughs> you've noticed. Yeah. Uh, how was that like? I, um, to be honest, I loved it. You loved I, I, um, I don't know if it's because no, I don't know if it's because I'm a Yorkshire man or I don't know, but I like. I like making money. I, I, but, you know, it's just something that I like doing. So, but I also, I don't think it's just the money making money. It's also about providing a service for somebody. And I've seen a right now. That's what I do every day. And I'm, I'm dealing with customers. And you know, I just had a customer in my office today showing him um, some of the stuff that I was working on. But back then. Because you tended to be locked in a little office, I mean, you, know, you weren't locked, I mean, it was your main, but um, you, you, were, you were tucked away in a little office every day and just working on this, you know, this one specialist area. I loved the, um, that customer interaction that you got through consultancy and it was, it was working on something different as well. So during working on my thesis, I was doing wheel rail contact tribology stuff. Mm. When I was working for the customers, I might have still been doing tribology, but I was working in different areas and I was building customer contacts as well. Um, and I, I just love that kind of relationship building, um, doing a good job, making the customer happy. And the added bonus is, is that you make a bit of extra money as well. Um, I love that. And th another thing that I got quite heavily involved with in as well is um, demonstrating for for the undergraduate students. And it wasn't just the money, but it, it was also, A, you felt like a lecturer, which was great, because I'd spent three, three or four years before that where I was the student and I was listening to the expert try, showing me how to solve the equations and and how to write up lab reports and all of a sudden I was the lecturer and I was showing the students how to so there was a, there was a good feeling from that and again it's, it's learning it's, it's learning new skills um, but it did hinder me in my in my final year I, I, I ended up working 
at least three days a week um, doing um, either consultancy or uh, demonstrating, which meant I uh, I didn't have much time to write up my PhD. I had to use um, weekends and, and what have you to write up my thesis. But fortunately, I'd done all that donkey work beforehand where I'd already written everything up. Um, so it wasn't... Um, it wasn't slacking off, shall we say. It was, you know, because I'd put away, I'd made the sacrifices early on. I could afford to to do that in in the final year. Mm. Yeah, I mean, do you think like the doing the consultancy work did that increase like generate like skills you didn't learn from the, the PhD? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that again, that that customer interaction. Um, stuff I, you you don't get a lot of that in a PhD and maybe some PhDs you do get that um, because you're uh, like yourself Adam you know you're you're, yeah. you're sponsored by a, 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 a company so you've got interactions with 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 them as well whereas for me mine my wasn't really sponsored by anybody um, so I didn't really get any of that Um so it teaches you, you know, interpersonal skills, how mm. to how to deal with customers, how to um, how to write proposals, how to cost projects. These are lots of skills that are really beneficial for life um, in a lot of different areas. But you don't necessarily tend to get taught them either at undergraduate or postgraduate. Um, you tend to have to go out and do it yourself. Um, mm. And that's something that the, the PhD offered me was to, you know, go out and and do that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, of, of non-academic skills that you can gain from gain from doing consultancy work. Mm. Yeah. Um, so getting back, like you, you mentioned before, like uh, you, you know, you were interested in actually, you know, like helping or helping make a difference to society. You know, with, like why you wanted to do a PhD, or also like, um, so uh, like early on, is that always? Did you have a desire to go in? Yes. Uh, did, did you have a desire to go into industry, and you already decided not to go in academia while you were doing your PhD, or is it? Are you not too sure? Um. I don't know what. Again, going back to the to my um, very unacademic um, school days, I, 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 it was my it's my father, my parents really that drove me um, and kind of guided me, and I, I'm really grateful for that because I think if I'd have been left to my own devices, um, I'm not sure where. I, I, I'm not saying I would have ended well. Touch wood. Hopefully, I wouldn't have ended up um, in a in a bad place, but maybe I wouldn't be where I am right now. Um, so, my my father wanted me to do a PhD. Um, somehow, he could see in me back then that I had the the, the potential to do that. Um, I don't know how he saw it, but um, he did see it, and he, he was right. But he he'd always said to me but you you want to go into industry first um so you know you do your undergraduate degree you get some industrial experience and then you do the academic um side of it um but it so that that was my plan that my plan was Mm. to do that um but there's always a trade-off you you could end up in industry and all of a sudden you've got a comfortable life, you're earning a decent salary, maybe you get married, have kids, and all of a sudden going back to university doesn't sound like a attractive proposition anymore. So that it's it's kind of swings and roundabouts. The other way is a bit like what happened to me is I went straight into academia and then spent a very long a long time there. Um and it was. It then became very difficult to get out of there, mm. um, e- even though I, I wanted to. Um, so it's yeah. It, it's. I'd still suggest maybe going into industry first and getting something. I, I think there's there's definitely something. There's 
there's pros and cons of both worlds. There's there's pros of the academic world, and there are pros of the commercial world. And a bit like the yin and yang, um, they 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 pull against each other, um, but they tend to, even though one's pulling that way and one's pulling that way, the net effect is that they pull you onto a, a, a well balanced path, shall we say? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's always good to have have um, the skills that you learn from both both areas. Okay. Yeah, so it's like I mean, it's like, it's like uh, continuing industry. Is that what something you see yourself staying? You know, you're happy at the moment. Um, I think so. Yeah, I I I really enjoy it. There's, like I say, that there's there's something about. Um, don't get me wrong. I loved my time in in academia, mm. um, but there, there's something about the commercial world that. Um, yeah. It, it just adds an extra drive to me, and and I think it's a personal thing. I think for some other people, they just they, it's the academia that gives them the drive. Um, but for me, that there's something about the commercial world and being able to blend that with academic. I'm still very in in touch with the academic side of things and and getting R and D projects underway and whatnot, and I, I really enjoy that. Um, but yeah, I, I see myself um, in in industry really um, for for at least the you know the medium term. Mm. Yeah, um, in hindsight, like looking back and like you know, you know over the past stuff you've done, would you, is there anything you say you'd change? You know, anything choices or like the academic or the professional path you would have changed, or would you say what you've done you're happy with? Um, no, I mean, there, there's all, I think everybody could probably look back at, at their life and say there's, there's things that, um, I could have done, um, better or differently, or what if I'd done this? I think a lot of that, it, you're, you're worrying about things that you can't really control, but then I think there, there are little things that maybe you could do, um, you could do better, not, there's there's nothing that really stands out to me, but I think um, I think when you're young, um, at the grand old age of 36 now, that I am looking back at life, you've got you've got a bit more energy, you've got a bit more freedom, and I think that's the time in your life where you really need to spend it, kind of honing your skills. I that's one thing that I look back. Uh, myself and think you know I, I really wish I'd worked a bit harder trying to trying to master that um, mm. master that craft um, because now I look at people who've got those skills and people who have mastered them and they're they're earning quite nice salaries you know and they've got quite nice lives and and I think it is something that I could have I could have mastered when I had the time, um, and I had the energy, um, but I didn't. I you know I, I turned to computer games or you know whatever. And and, and it's it's good to have a, a healthy work life balance. Don't get me wrong, but I think um, yeah, there's some times where you you need to put your head down and 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 whatnot. So that that's my um, that's probably my only only real regret that I'd maybe. If I could turn back the time, and uh, you know, there is there's one one specific instance in my life that I won't go into into details, but I was yeah. um, I was offered a project um, when I when I did my um, year in industry, um, which would have been a mountain to climb. It would have mm-hmm. been not just in terms of learning curve, but the sheer physical volume of work um and i regrettably turned it down and i i really wish i could go back and 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 change that decision um but you know you um you go through life you make decisions and cards fall the way they fall and you know you've just got to make the best of it um but yeah any advice to any you know um 
young people out there right now is, you know, really try and take every opportunity that you get um, and doing doing the hard work at a young age really pays dividends, you know, when you, when you get older. Mm. Yeah, I think that's like the general, you know, you know, general advice is that you know the more work you put in, and you know, you, earlier on, the better, you know, the the better you are in the outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say, like, you know, during like PhD consultancy work and all that? What would you say was like your like most in like most enjoyed like project? I know what, and like what was your most like influential output you've you've seen from them? <sighs> One of the bits that sticks out for me is um, I did a consultancy project for a big company, shall we say, um, and it ended up, not only did it spawn a research paper, but it also became part of a technical standard for um, mm. for this company as well, and they, they still use it today to to um to vet suppliers so they have many people try they're they're a very big company and they have many people supplying lots of different things um and part of the work that i did is actually help develop um part of this standard that i um as i recall i still use it today um to vet suppliers um another another surprise for me is the amount of papers that I've written. Um, again, if you, English was my worst subject at school. I hated writing. I hated learning to spell. It it, it was all terrible. Um, so to fast forward um, 20 odd years and now have 23, 24 journal papers um, is a bit of a shock. But it's one of those unrealized skills, I think, that I had. Um, that, that yeah, it's, it's just an unexpected output, really, from that. And I'm, I'm still involved with with paper writing. I've I've written uh, an article for a magazine recently. Um, I contribute to the the company's internal newspaper. I quite enjoy writing actually. I think that's that's one of the one of the gifts that came out of doing a PhD really was realizing that even though I didn't I wasn't very good at writing at at school, I'm actually quite I I'm actually quite good at it and um I've I've learned to enjoy it as well. Um it, I find it much easier to get words on paper than to get them out of my head sometimes. Um I can I can explain really technical things on paper that sometimes I really, really struggle um, if I'm trying to um, to, to say it to people. But, um, yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm in a similar boat. It's like, you know, I, when I was younger, I probably didn't see myself going to, like, you know, do a PhD because I had dyslexia, you know, similar situation I didn't like to learn you know I didn't like you know like to learn like how you know write sense you know write stuff down <laughs> but yeah you soon yeah I think it's 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 a bit like un- it's exercising a, a muscle that you didn't really use mm. in school and and I think it's because school is is quite a tough time I don't you don't realize this until you look back you know 20 years pr- prior in my case and realize that it, it's not just the learning you know there's the, the whole social interaction with other other kids and and learning how life works from a, a social perspective that's, that's actually really quite stressful when you look back at it and i think that has an impact on learning so if you if you're really struggling with something um at school you've got that mountain to climb but on top of that you've got all the other social mountains to climb as well but then you get into university you're doing something that you're really interested in you've got friends that have got like-minded interests you know I, mm. I got to university and I, I used to be the only person at school that was 
interested in mechanical stuff and cars and, and whatnot. And I was always a bit of an odd bod. But then I went to university and everybody was into cars and the way things work. And all of a sudden you're with people that you enjoy being with, shall we say, and you're learning stuff that you want to learn. And I think it, it then unlocks other skills that maybe got a bit kind of, um, for lack of a better word, suppressed at school um, because you had other pressures to deal with. But yeah, you can you can surprise yourself sometimes, I think, with, um, with skills that you didn't realise you had. Mm. And um, getting terms like like working at the moment, you know, in British Steel, like how do you think like the uh, like the COVID situation has affected you know your uh, in working environments? Um, I'm first of all very fortunate that I've that I'm still in employment. Um, I realise that's not the case for a lot of people, um, but it's 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 made things challenging, um, should we say? Life is 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 definitely very different. Um, I'm fortunate that I can still go into work because I've still got a, a a valid excuse to be there. You know, we 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 have to deal with bits of broken uh, rail, just like this one here. Here's one I made earlier. Um, and I can't do that at home. I don't have saws and drills and and microscopes at home. Um, so I've got to be in in to do that. Um, so it's not it's not affecting me that way. I did I did spend the first lockdown working from home, um, but then I ran out of things that I needed to write and I had to come back in into the mill. Um, it's it's definitely made things a challenge though. Um, mm. I think more from a personal perspective from than from a work perspective though is you know you, you works the same but when you come out of work that's the bit that's different. All of a sudden you, you can't go and meet friends. You know I haven't seen my family for I don't know how long. Oh, well, Christmas Day. I, I went there for Christmas Day and that's it. I haven't seen them since. Um, so yeah, life's um, very challenging at the minute. But I'd say it's probably not. It's it's affected personal life more than more than work life. Mm. Yeah, it's more that personal interaction that's different. Yeah, and it's it, it, it. I think it, it it adds a lot to life that mm. we haven't realised until now because we've not missed it before. We, it, it's only now that it's gone that we realised what we had. Um, but yeah, it, it makes it, it makes life more. Um, it makes you work harder, shall we say? Because you you can you can be at the office and then you can come back and you know you, the world's your oyster. You know you can see your friends or you can um, go for a walk or you know go out on your bike. And, or go to the supermarket and not have to wear a mask. Okay. All right. I'm going to hand it over to Paul now. Uh, he's going to ask you a few more questions. So, Paul, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure thing. So, uh, first of all, on, on, up until this point, it's really impressive how you managed to get to the point where you are now. It's, it's really a very interesting story for a person. Uh, as you yourself said, uh, initially... You may not have thought that you could end up in this position, but here you are today. So it's really inspiring for a lot of people that are in similar situations, perhaps, to see that, you know, sometimes you need to, you know, do make the extra step, uh, believe in yourself, make some decisions, take some risks and take it to the next level all the time. Uh, one question that I believe a lot of uh, people that are doing a PhD actually have is the following. So in your case, you specifically mentioned that it is advisable for people to first go in the industry before doing a PhD. Uh, but one of the most important questions perhaps is the following one. Uh, when it comes down to the qualifications a PhD gives to a person compared to the qualifications you gain through work experience, for example, or a more technical degree, would you specifically say that a PhD helps you more in the pursuit of a career in industry than 
actually working in the industry would when it comes down to a high end position, for example? Um, there's a lot there, so you might need to remind me. Um, but first of all, thank you for your um, introduction. It's, um, you make me sound like Bill Gates, but um, <laughs> maybe not not as, not as successful as that. But I always use people like that to inspire me, um, even though I might not ever get to any level approaching Bill Gates. You know, if you use that as an inspiration and and do do the best that you can. Um, but um, I'll address the last bit of your question because that's the only bit I remember. <laughs> one, <laughs> my, the one, one weakness I have is my short-term memory. So um, keeping hold of... So does a PhD prepare you better for industry? Um, yes and no. I, I think that what a PhD teaches you is that life goes wrong um, you know I, th I think this is one of these quotes that's um, attributed to John Lennon I'm not sure if he said it or not but he, he, he said that um, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans and that is exactly what a PhD is mm. uh, especially if you're doing an experimental one which mine was mine was based you make plans to do these tests or whatever you've got to do and something will go wrong something always goes wrong i've never ever done a set of experiments where they actually went exactly to plan and i think that prepares you for life in that actually nothing ever goes to plan and the the way that it prepares you is that you become very good at innovating so if something goes wrong, if, if that test doesn't go quite right because the temperature is not right, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to restart the test or am I going to take that into account uh, in my analysis or what am, what am I going to do? Yeah, I think, and there's two ways of, of, of learning that. One is just through experience. So if you've worked in industry or academia for a long time, you've got a lot of experience. You you understand how how life works. The other way is not necessarily a PhD, but because it's the subject to the question, a PhD is a crash course in it. A, a PhD is a crash course in life going wrong. It's like taking you straight to the deep end when you've got no swimming experience or very little. Um, you know, you've done your degree. So you've got a little bit of swimming experience and then you get thrown in straight at the deep end and you've got to learn how to cope with life going wrong. So that's the answer to your final bit. You'll have to remember, remind me of the other bits. That, that, that was basically it. So what, what's the key skills you're actually getting from a PhD that can make a PhD graduate competitive? And you've basically pretty much answered that. Question. I, think, I think the core of it is you, you obviously learn a lot of skills you know, academic skills and, and technical skills, but I think the biggest thing that you get is life goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And some people, um, some people think depend on others to lead them through situations like that. Whereas other people, whether you've learnt it from experience or you've learnt it through doing something like a PhD, you become the leader of chaos or leading people through chaos not not a chaotic leader but <laughs> <laughs> leading people through chaos you know little problems that happen um i think that's that's one of the biggest bits that you get from so so when it comes down to well, for example let's assume that uh, you have a position in british steel right and you are in the committee that's going to hire a new uh person so, and you see a PhD graduate, right? That comes in walking and scared about the position and everything, right? Uh, what is the uh, most important skill you would say that this PhD student would need to have, a PhD graduate basically, would need to have in order to be competitive for a position in industry? Would you say that is this exactly this innovation that you mentioned before, or is it something else that you would pay particular attention to? Mm, I think different people bring different things to the party um, so that is a good skill to have but you probably 
only need one person or two people, depending on how big your team is, you probably only need one person to be really good at that and be able to to lead everyone else through um, the change. But there's 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 other skills. You know, you need people with um, with good CAD skills. Um, you know, I don't really have good CAD skills. I, I learned it at undergraduate, but I, I always found it a bit of a challenge. And some people are really good at it and they get paid lots of money to do it because there's not a lot of people with those skills. But, you know, you need people with those skills. You need people with um, mathematical modeling skills. Again, something that is just not uh, in my nature, shall we say. Um, I think you've got to learn to look out for um, what what things are. And I think that that's what, I mean, to be honest, that's what I picked up from a PhD was the life goes wrong and how to cope with it. Mm -hmm. But that's just my experience. Maybe other people will pull other things out of it. Um, but in, in terms of what to look for, I, I think it's, um, it's more about talking to people um, and really kind of during that interview process really kind of figuring out how they how they work um you know what what makes them draw what makes them go um not necessarily what they're interested in and not necessarily what their skills are now it, it's are you willing to learn new skills or mm. um do i think there's lots of lots of different things that you need to take into account um that is a very fair point you've actually brought up. So I I would term it as adaptability, perhaps, or the ability yeah, to learn. That's, you know, that's a good, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is really important for young people in general. I think not only people that are graduating from a PhD, but everyone who is kind of new to yeah. find a, an industrial or an academic environment. They need to be willing to acquire new skills and. You know, yeah. because some people think that oh, I have a PhD now. I'm at like the top in their heads for some reason. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to be very much out there and they go to a job, uh, a real life industrial job and they assume that they know everything when in fact, you know, you're still learning when yeah. you're going into industry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, just to come back on that, I think the, the, it, it, on the other side of the equation, the actual interviewers as well, it, it they have a lot to offer and I think a lot of people that do interviews are just ticking boxes and they're just looking for specific skills but they're not really looking for it's a bit like um, people that invest um, like on Dragon's Den and they say we're not investing in the idea we're investing in the person you know, I think you've got to see that drive and that spark in people, um, which unfortunately, I'm, it's something that I'm not very good at giving that impression <laughs> for whatever reason. But um, so I think a lot of employers just say, "Now he just looks like he's going to be stay in bed all day." But um, I don't know why it's just my persona. But um, yeah, I think you've got to spot, but you, you've got to have the right person on the other end of the table in an interview to be able to spot that. And I think a lot of employers don't necessarily have that person there who's the right person to spot that. And I think if you're hiring an engineer, you need another. You need an engineer on the other end of the table. If you're hiring a, a pharmaceutical person, you need a, you know, a person with those skills. And, and a lot of the, a lot of these people that do interviews, they use somebody from you know, human resources or, yeah. or or whatever, and that don't necessarily they can't see what you have to bring to the table. Yeah, that's absolutely to the point. And I think this may be really interesting for people who may be watching us right now that are in companies that perhaps they should be considering themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, my final question to conclude this part of the interview is the following one, and it's going to be a very fun question, actually. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, from your experience up until this point, and looking forward, how do you think the rail industry is going to evolve 
in the following years, not just in terms of the products, but in terms of how it's actually working, like with the Internet of Things and everything, right? So that's the question. Uh, I think I think there's ideally what should happen, and then there's the reality of what will happen, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but let's let's go with the the semi idealistic of what should happen. Um, or what potentially what can happen um, I think IOT has a lot to offer um, the rail industry um, I'm, I'm not one of these people that um, and maybe we'll get blasted for this but I'm not the, the environment is not my passion I, I think it's important I think you know we should do our best to to look after it we should do our best to look after what we're giving to our future generation of people um but there, there are other problems in in the world as well um but i think rail has got the potential to be a big solution to that you know it's it's a very efficient way of moving very heavy things or lots of people very large distances um due to the physics of steel on steel um, rolling contacts. Um, it's probably not the best deployed resource that we've got at the minute. Um, limit, the problem we've got in, in the UK is we're, we're, we used to be pioneers. We used to be the first to do a lot of things. Uh, with first to build the railways, you know, the first to invent the steam engine, blah, blah, blah. The problem is well, they're always the first to make the mistakes as well. And the rest of the world watches, or this this is how it used to be, the rest of the world watch, watch does make the mistakes and then did it, but they did it better. So we've got railway lines that go in zigzags all over the place and train, our trains can't go that fast as a result and and what have you and the rest of the world looks at that and said well why did you do that why do you just build big straight lines and that's what they do and that's why they've got you know arguably railways that work a bit better than than ours but um that to one side there's a lot of challenges in rail that i think can be can be helped with technology um rail networks are massive things they are big expanses of metal, wood, concrete, lots of engineering materials. And it's not possible for us to monitor that whole system um, with people um, as, as much as it'd be good to keep everybody employed and, and what have you. You, you need something to help you um, with that. And, you know, Customers, uh, especially rail operators, are always having problems. That you know, they're always getting rails that break or problems. There's a, there's lots of very interesting tribological problems in in rail. Um, but if it happens in a wooded area of the country that's maybe 200 miles away from where you are, you're not going to know about it. And the, at the minute. Usually the only way you know about it is when, oh, I'll bring my uh, prop back, is when this happens. And mm. fortunately, when that happens, when the rail breaks, the track signal um, fails. And that's how they know that the rail's broken. But that's the, that's the only way they know. I think with, with robotics and AI and the I, IoT and remote condition monitoring, we really can kind of help... Um, help the networks to to make it more efficient you know to spot a, to spot problems that ha that happening very remotely before they become a major problem so before your rail breaks if you can assess the vibration state in the in the rail or the or, or whatever's whatever's been emit, energy has been emitted from the rail as the train goes over it and you can use that to predict um, what's going to happen then it, it it lowers your costs because you might not need to replace the rail maybe you just need to carry out a, a simple repair um, I think it really can help and if we 
one of the big things that puts people off using the railway is its limited capacity. You know, it's um, as long as we've got cars and you can, you know, get into your car whenever you want from your doorstep and it'll take you to exactly where you want. Um, I think until we make railways very competitive with that model of car ownership, we're not going to, it's not going to become the, um, what it could potentially be. Um, and I think there's a lot of other interesting um, technologies in terms of light rail um, and and pods that can move people about. So your, your train, your express trains can take you from cities to cities. But once you get out of there, your destination might still be another five miles from the train station. So you get off the express train onto a small pod, automated pod. It might be on rails, it might not be on rails. And then that can take you to your, your destination. Um, so I think railways, to cut the long, long story short, railways have got a big, a pet, potentially a big part to play in helping us become a more efficient society. I, I like to think about efficiency. Um, you know, we we inherited this. Um, earth shall we say this planet that, that provides us with its resources and okay our, our forebears that came before us they had to extract those minerals and you know cause what we'd call today pollution and, and what have you in order to get us where we are you know well you know we're, we're fortunate that we are here today i'm talking to you on a computer even though you're um miles away from me you know, that would not be possible if we'd not been inefficient with resources, shall we say, in mm -hmm. the past. But now we're at this stage, I think we, we should now start thinking about being more efficient with things and, you know, getting as much energy as we can out of our resources. Um, and um, I'm kind of... I got lost now. Um, so right. Yeah, it, the, the way I see it is, it's not necessarily just about climate or not using oil or going to battery-powered things. It's about being, yeah, it's about being as efficient as we can with the resources that we've got, um, because we inherited these, you know, um, and we need to pass on what we have got to the next generation, um, so that they can make use of them as well yeah. and in a world that's got finite resources the only way you do that is by becoming more and more and more efficient um so there you go that's my thesis yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well very interesting remarks of a role because uh, becoming more efficient is actually the key to being able to produce more because the demand is constantly going up right it's, ne it's yeah. never going down we always demand more so in a planet with finite resources, as you said, perhaps the only way to keep supplying more is by using what we have in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. So with that remark, I will conclude my part of the interview. Thank you okay. very much. And I'll hand it back to Adam for the time being. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Lewis. That was very interesting. Um, so, yeah, I would like to uh, say this, uh, that's the end of our podcast. Uh, look forward to our next uh, episode. Um, yeah.